Uh, what we did, though, since there were so many important issues that we weren't able to address, we've invited organizations to place information on their issues at the back table. And these are equally to important of what we're discussing today. And we, we have time right after the summit from noon to one. We'll still have coffee out, and we're going to have our jazz musician. And representatives of those organizations are going to be kind of lingering by those tables. So please do go back, pick up that information, talk to them about their issues. Uh, I'd like to honor all of the legislators who are attending today. It, it turned out to be a really busy day at the Capitol, so legislators are going to be coming in and out. But I'll quick read the names of, of those who are going to attend. Senators Sandy Pappas, Carrie Dietzik, Carla Nelson, Fung Her, John Marty, Carrie Rood, Julie Rosen, Susan Kent, Melissa Franzen, Ann Rest. I feel like let there be light. Um, Representatives Aaron Murphy, Connie Bernardi, John Lesh, Ron Cresha, Joe Mullery, Phyllis Kahn, Karen Clark, Ray Dean, Rena Moran, David Bly, Jennifer Loon, Dave Pintel, Yvonne Seltzer, and Paul Thiessen. And I'm not sure Phyllis Kahn is able to join us today. Uh, her husband recently died, and we all extend our deepest sympathy to her. We also have a couple of dignitaries that are joining us today. The Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Human Rights, Kevin Lindsay, and coming all the way from New York City just for this event is the Regional Administrator of the U.S. Department of Labor Women's Bureau, Grace Protus. Did I miss anybody who's here right now who I should recognize? Don't everybody stand. <laughs> um, all right, there, there were two or three people that were placed in charge of planning each session, and they've worked very hard and have put together a sterling agenda, and I'd like to recognize them. The caregiving session, Erin Parrish from AARP and Leanna Smith with the Metropolitan Caregiver Service Collaborative. Transportation, Deb Fitzpatrick with the Center on Women in Public Policy, which is part of the Humphrey School at the University, and Lisa Stratton, who's with Gender Justice. The session on voices of indigenous and immigrant women, uh, Fartoon Welly with Isarun, Kenya McKnight with the Black Women's Business Alliance, and Bo Talyarabi with the Asian American Pacific Islanders in Philanthropy. A special word about the Women of Color session that we have today. Now imagine the challenge of bringing together the voices of all the many minority communities in Minnesota into a one hour session. This promises to be an historic session. You'll hear from women from Minnesota's African American, Asian American, American Indian, Latina, Liberian, and Somali communities. Um, this gives a glimpse into why this morning's schedule is so very full, and why regrettably we're not able to include question and answer time from the audience, and we're, we're very sorry about that. But we do urge you instead to continue this discussion after from noon to one at those back networking tables, but also online through Twitter. And our hashtag is um, MNWESS. It's at the top right hand of every slide. And also just talk to the presenters and to each other from noon to one. So we're ready to go. It promises to be a very fun ride this morning. I'd like to introduce now Deb Fitzpatrick, who is going to be our overall moderator of the event. Deb is director of the University of Minnesota Humphrey School Center on Women and Public Policy. She's also a founding member of the Minnesota Women's Economic Security Coalition. Thank you, everybody, and uh, welcome. Um, so uh, as Barbara mentioned, uh, I uh, am uh, director of the Center on Women and Public Policy at the Humphrey School, and I'm a founding member of the Minnesota Coalition for Women's Economic Security. I also am the lead researcher on an ongoing uh, project looking at the status of women and girls in Minnesota that uh, we do with the Women's Foundation of Minnesota. Uh, we produce a report every couple years that looks at how women are doing across the state, women and girls are doing across the state of Minnesota. It's in your pack. I encourage you to take a look at it. But it really talks about how women are doing in economics, but how that's interconnected to health and reproductive justice, how that's connected to violence against women, and how it's connected to leadership uh, and the uh, lack of uh, women in leadership across the state of Minnesota, across sectors. So I encourage you to take a look at that. 
Um, so uh, today I did want to just spend a few minutes talking about some trends that I think make me optimistic about our ability to uh, move on these issues of economic justice and economic inequality in the state of Minnesota, in particular for women. Um, so the, this is not a map, actually, of uh, where Vikings fans are concentrated. <laughs> It is actually a map of where working women are concentrated. And you can see that Minnesota uh, is above average. So purple is above average on this map. And Minnesota is actually a national leader in women's workforce participation. And that is super good news for our economy, but it also is challenging for our families. Uh, and. Uh, but it's also really critically important for the prosperity uh, and growth of our state. So we also know that, of course, that it's uh, okay, not working. Uh, really important <laughs> that uh, we take advantage of all of the talent in our state. And it's really imperative, actually, for our state to continue to grow and prosper. Uh, and I think there's a couple of areas where we have some opportunities. We have opportunities to make better uh, to make better use of the women in our state who are mothers. We have better opportunities to make use of the older people in our state, including uh, women. And of course, we have great opportunities to make better use of the people in our communities of color. Black lives do matter in this context as well as in our so and, and as well as in our justice system. The, a second trend that I think is really important is that there's a growing recognition that policies that are good for women are also good for men. And they're good for kids, and they're good for families, and they're good for our economy. Uh, and so we know that millennials are demanding more balance uh, in their lives. Uh, and uh, recognizing that outdated gender norms about uh, work and family are not only hurting women, but they hurt men as well. And so research is really stacking up about the importance of a paid paternity leave, uh, which is even more rare, of course, than paid maternity leave. Uh, and we know that, these, that paid paternity leave not only benefits men uh, and kids, but results in higher wages for women. So the third trend I wanted to mention is the uh, silver tsunami. Uh, this tidal wave really just demands that we're going to have to take action. Um, and uh, in the, uh, we find that a uh, recent survey found that 75% of people are uh, 40 to 65 years old are expecting that their families are going to provide their long-term care. And so uh, we know that uh, in the end, the cost-benefit analysis kind of comes down in favor of helping our seniors age in place with dignity and with the support of their families. Um, and we know that uh, states that advance creative solutions to keep people in the workforce through aging and caregiving are going to win. And finally, the last thing I just wanted to mention is that we see from poll after poll that um, our policies are really out of step with voters. Um, that we know that by wide margins, uh, people across the political spectrum, Republicans, independents, and Democrats, uh, really support paid family leave, paid sick leave, uh, child care support, and other uh, efforts like these that help families balance work and family. Now, this is Peggy Young. Uh, some of you may have heard of Peggy Young. Uh, she was fired for asking for a light duty assignment at UPS when she was pregnant. The kind of accommodation that male colleagues had received for things like spraining their ankle while they were playing softball, for example. Um, and her case is now before the US Supreme Court. Now, Margot Dorfman, the CEO of the US Women's Chamber of Commerce, uh, recently wrote an op-ed about this case. And she said that every American should hope the US Supreme Court acts affirmatively in the upcoming Young versus UPS case. The decision on Young versus UPS will not only speak to the rights and value of women in our workforce today, the outcome will have a profound impact on the continued growth and prosperity of the American economy. So 
regardless of what the Supreme Court does in that case, the Minnesota Women's Economic Security Act uh, ensured that the Peggy Youngs of the state of Minnesota can stay on the job and contribute to our growth and prosperity in the Minnesota economy. And not only that, in the, their arguments before the Supreme Court, UPS said that due to state laws like Minnesota's, uh, that they had changed their policy for everyone across the country. So these policies are driving national change. Now, um, this is not an onion headline. <laughs> um, perhaps it was an overstatement, uh, but the nation watched in 2014 as Minnesota became the first state to pass a comprehensive package of bills designed to address the gender pay gap and modernize our workplaces. And I am thrilled that two of the legislative leaders who uh, not only put their political reputations, but put their political power uh, behind uh, this bill to make Minnesota uh, a model for the nation are here with us today. Now, in the State of the Union address, President Obama asked states to step up and make the kind of changes that our uh, families need that, and the kind of progress that is impossible in Washington right now. Uh, and Representative Paul Thiessen and Senator Sandy Pappas uh, did just that, as well as many other legislators who are in the room today. And I also want to acknowledge uh, some other key folks that were involved in this effort. Uh, Kate Perushik, who's the Director of Policy for the Speaker's Office at the time. Uh, Jill Sletton, who was a Chief Lobbyist for the Women's Economic Security Act and Kim Borton and the Women's Foundation of Minnesota that uh, funded those efforts. And then I also just want to acknowledge that, I, that many thousands of people across the state of Minnesota and organizations contributed to passage of the Women's Economic Security Act. If you were one of those people that wrote a letter, called somebody, advanced knowledge about this act, please raise your hand. Excellent. So this was a really broad-based effort. So with that, I want to just now introduce uh, a couple of our legislative leaders on this act. Um, it is not an exaggeration to say that without Re uh, Representative Paul Thiessen, WISA, WISA would not have happened. Uh, he and Representative Aaron Murphy, and I don't know if she's here yet, um, really brought the founding members of the Minnesota Coalition for Women's Economic Security together uh, to help design the best bill possible and then put the full power of the Speaker's office behind its passage. Meanwhile, over in the Senate, Senator Sandy Pappas, a longtime advocate for women and the Senate president, leaped at the opportunity to uh, chief author our omnibus bill. Uh, and fought tooth and nail to get WISA through multiple committees in a short uh, legislative session and to the Senate floor where it barely survived a 34-33 nail-biter uh, motion to send it back to conference committee uh, where it probably would have died or at, best, or at best been significantly weakened. So with that, I'd like to invite Senator Pappas and uh, Representative Thiessen up to uh, share some of their thoughts about what we did with the Women's Economic Security Act and where we're going from here. Good morning, everyone. We're actually not going to um, talk about what we did last year and remind you about our victories and our successes that uh, Deb Fitzpatrick alluded to. We're talking about what's next because there's still work to be done to improve the workplace life for women and their families and the men that love them and support them. Um, so first of all, I want to ask how many of you in the audience have ever gone to work sick? How many of you in your workplace now have earned sick pay? Not all of you. How many of you have gone to work sick because you would lose pay if you didn't go to work? All right. 41% of workers living in Minnesota lack even a single earned payday. 
This is even more pronounced among low-income and part-time workers. Do I have a little bit of a funny feedback here? I'll just try this one. Can you hear me a little better? All right, so back to what I was talking about. I'm losing my name tag here. Um, so this, uh, this, I, this, I'll uh, back to, this is 41% of workers living in Minnesota lack even a single earned sick day, and this is even more pronounced among low-income and part-time workers. Access to earned sick pay promotes safe and healthy work environments by reducing the spread of illness and workplace injuries, reduces health care costs, and helps parents care for their children. So I'm going to give you some statistics here, which is always more difficult to follow than wonderful stories, which you'll be, I'm sure you'll be hearing later today. Among all workers in Minnesota, 49% have earned sick, but over 1 million workers, or 41%, do not. We're doing a little better in the public sector. 82% of public sector workers have paid sick, but only 60% of private sector workers have earned sick leave. Hispanic workers are even less likely to have earned sick days. 60% lack access to earned sick. Not unexpectedly, the lowest penetration for earned sick days is the service industry, where only 35% have earned sick. And only 26% of part-time workers have earned sick pay. And only one-third of full-time workers earning under $15,000 annually have earned sick day. So part-time, low-income servers are the least likely to have earned, earned sick day. So what are the benefits if employers do provide earned sick? Research, research documents show that workers with influenza, duh, perform more poorly on a variety of tasks than healthy workers. <laughs> we all know that. A recent study found that employers who provide earned sick reported fewer occupational injuries. And earned sick helps reduce the spread of illness in the workplace by making it possible for contagious workers to stay home where they belong. Parents without access to earned sick or earn sick that doesn't include care of children are twice as likely to send their children to school or daycare sick. Again, sick children who can stay home are not spreading illness in their schools and daycare centers. Finally, earn sick leave allows workers to take time away from work for medical appointments rather than waiting until after work hours when they're more likely to use more costly hospital emergency services. Okay, so what's the good news? Minnesotans loved earned sick days. 72% support workers having paid sick days. My guess is they don't really want sick people serving food or cooking their food in restaurants, infecting their parents and grandparents in nursing homes, and spreading illness to their kids in school or daycare. So 72% of Minnesotans. And we actually have that breakdown county by county, which we'll be bringing to legislators. Speaking of legislators, so we're going to be introducing the uh, Earn Sick Day bill in the Senate and in the House on Monday. So watch for it in the news. This is a little advanced tip. Representative John Lesh is carrying the bill in the House again, and I'm carrying the bill in the Senate. And we're going to be holding a press conference in Duluth on Tuesday with Take Action Minnesota. The Senate bill will be heard in the State and Local Government Committee and then in the Jobs Committee, we hope. And the House, we're not, we're not sure at this point if the bill's going to get a hearing. There's lots of enthusiasm for this very important legislation. It's really, really the next step after raising the minimum wage and other visa provisions that we did last year. However, for all of you, it's very important that you let your legislators, House and Senate members, let them know that you support Earn Sick Day for all workers. Because all the reasons I listed above, it's a public health issue, sick people are contagious. It's a workplace safety and productivity issue. Work people, sick people are more likely to have accidents and make mistakes. And it's a caregiving issue. Sick children shouldn't have to go to school or daycare. It's really a quality of life issue for all of us. For heaven's sake, let sick people stay home and in bed where they belong. Thank you. Well, um, I want to thank everyone for coming today as well and uh, just to reflect a little bit on the passage of WESA last year really thank all of you uh, in this room for all the work you did contacting your legislators uh, and uh, writing letters and doing whatever you did to make sure that we 
we're able to make the progress that we made last year. I do want to thank Sandy in particular uh, for the incredible work she did on the Senate side. We, uh, you know, one of the great things about the WISA bill uh, is that it, uh, in the House in particular, passed with pretty strong bipartisan support. And I think that's really important. And there's a number of legislators here today. If you just want to stand up who were involved in the legislation last year, uh, I see Ray Dean is here and Karen Clark is here and uh, Ron Kreish is in the back uh, and Senator, or uh, Representative Howe. Um, what? And Phyllis, of course, is here. Yes. Um, and, uh, but th that I think is really, was really, really important for us to, to make progress on this and show that it actually uh, isn't, wasn't a partisan issue, but an issue for Minnesotans. Uh, but m perhaps the most dramatic moment of the legislative session last year, I was sitting in my office with Kate and a number of other folks watching the Senate debate on the bill and the motion to re-refer it back to conference committee that Deb talked about. Uh, and it really, um, I don't know, it was 10, 20 minutes that we were waiting for that vote to, to finally get to 34. Uh, and um, and the, the one person I do, I kind of, two people I guess I want to acknowledge, uh, Tom Saxhog and Dan Sparks. Uh, Tom Saxhog's from up north and Dan Sparks from Austin, Minnesota were the two votes that kind of put it over the top. Uh, and they may not get as much credit as they deserve, but the person that really gets the credit is Sandy, who, who did an incredible job in the Senate moving that, that bill through. So, you know, and, and Deb touched on this as well, but one of the other great things about this is it really has become a model for uh, stuff going uh, around, across, on across the nation. Um, we were, uh, Sandy and I have both been to, to conferences uh, at the White House and in other, other places talking about this bill. And when we talk about what we were able to accomplish in Minnesota because of all the work that all of you did, uh, people, re they, they really can't believe it. Uh, and a lot of this, you know, it's a lot of talk in other places, but here in Minnesota we were able to turn it into action. Uh, and I don't know if people followed, but uh, up in North Dakota, uh, which, you know, is, is not probably as progressive a state as Minnesota, um, there's a, a representative up there, Ka uh, Ka Kylie Overson, uh, who brought uh, a bill forward uh, to, a, to a committee um, that uh, sounds somewhat familiar. It's, it was to close the w gender wage gap uh, by doing what we did here, requiring companies doing business with the state uh, to report and to meet certain standards in terms of uh, how they're going to close the gap on pay, uh, pay equity. Uh, and it was an all-male committee, as it turns out. Uh, but those legislators there said, that they needed more proof that a problem existed uh, before they were willing to take action. And in, in North Dakota, you know, we're at, what, 80 cents on the dollar here. In North Dakota, they're at 70 cents on the dollar for women. They rank 47th in the country. Uh, so they probably don't need much more proof. But it just shows that um, the progress we made here is not something that automatically happens. And it only happens uh, because of the work uh, that all of you are doing uh, and all of you have done. And so we made you know, great strap, uh, strides in terms of moving toward equal pay, ensuring that businesses are complying with existing equal pay laws, uh, moving towards greater pay equity in the private sector uh, to make sure that women are paid um, uh, for jobs, the same as men for jobs of comparable worth. Um, but those inequities uh, are continuing. Uh, and it's not the only inequity that we have to, to address here. And, and Sandy touched on one, which is uh, the earned sick leave, which is something that is really important and that we need to move forward on this year. But the truth is that a number of other workplace policies uh, in this country and in this state lag behind most other industrialized nations. Um, and it's limited, and, you know, and the impact of it is it really is there's a human impact. It limits the ability uh, of spouses to care for ailing loved ones, uh, for parents to care for sick children, uh, for people to hold down good paying jobs uh, because of these leave policies. And if those leave policies are offered at all, uh, they're unpaid. And so we're fam basically what we're doing is forcing families to make impossible choices. And that, I think, is what this really comes down to. We shouldn't be putting families and men and women and, other, and Minnesotans in general in a, dis in a situation where they have to choose uh, between staying at home with a sick kid or because they're sick, staying at home to care for an older loved one and going to work and losing their job or losing significant pay. Uh, we shouldn't be putting families in the decision, and this is Joe Biden's line, but I think it really sums this up, really, sums things up really well. We shouldn't be putting families and parents in the position of having to put, choose between either putting bread on the table or being around the table at dinner time with their kids. And that's really kind of, I think, what this, this ultimately comes down to. So, you know, we did make some progress on this front. We moved from six to 12 weeks of unpaid leave for a number of employers last year. Uh, and we now allow the leave to be, uh, for uh, parenting leave, 
to be used before birth, during pregnancy, as well as afterwards, if that is needed. Uh, and while that's welcome, that unpaid nature of the leave uh, makes it uh, very difficult for some lower income and middle class families to take advantage of it because they, certain, they simply can't afford the financial hit. So one of our top priorities this year, uh, building on the progress we made last year, is going to be uh, paid, uh, paid family leave. And um, you know, right now, only 11% of private sector workers in the United States have paid family leave. Uh, most other countries, as I said, offer this and allow this. But in the United States, that's not the case. Now, Minnesota is not quite the leader in this. Uh, California, New Jersey, and Rhode Island now offer paid leave programs uh, for, their, for their residents. Uh, and workers in these states are eligible for six weeks of paid family leave uh, at between 55 and 66% 60 of their salary. Uh, and this partial wage replacement really is what can make the difference between whether a family can access this paid family leave or not. Um, it's good for the workers and their families for obvious reasons, but we also know that it's good for business. And one of the conferences I was at uh, this summer around these issues, a number of CEOs of major corporations, probably one of those 11% that offers this, uh, but a big corporation says this absolutely uh, helps their competitive situation because they're able to retain workers, uh, they're able to keep qualified and skilled employees. Morale and productivity improves uh, when they have this, uh, this uh, paid family leave policy in place uh, and costly turnover is avoided. So it's good for the workers and their families. Uh, it's good for business. And, it also, uh, and, and I also think it's important to emphasize this isn't just for parenting leave. This isn't just for new moms and dads. One of the big challenges that was pointed out by Deb, uh, demographic challenges we see, uh, is this growing age wave that we have. And I don't know if folks know, but you know, if you think about all, there's going to be a lot of discussion around nursing homes and long-term care this year. But 90% of the care for older Minnesotans is not paid for by taxpayers through Medicaid for nursing homes or anything else. It's conducted by what we call informal caregivers, people that take care of their aging spouse or for their parents uh, at home uh, and provide that service just as a, as a family, you know, as what you do as a member of a family or what you do as a friend for your aging adult. Uh, friend, and it saves us in the state uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars every year. You know, if those people went on Medicaid and had to go to a nursing home, or we paid for a, a professional caregiver to go in and take care of these aging adults, um, it would cost us hundreds and hundreds of millions of more dollars as taxpayers. Uh, nearly two thirds of workers between ages of 45 and 74 uh, provide, provide some care to an aging or adult family member. And these workers need to take time off from work. Uh, there's economic impacts, there's health impacts for this informal caregiving. Uh, so we need to do some, some work on that. Um, and it is going to make a big difference for us. So the reality is without paid family leave, these informal caregivers are going to continue to face this financial insecurity that we're facing uh, in assuming these caregiving roles. They'll save less for the future. They'll put their health uh, more at risk because of the stress. They'll be forced to leave the workforce. Uh, which, uh, again, if you look at the demographics, we're, gonna, we're actually going to have a huge shortage of workers uh, in the next 10 to 20 years, and they're going to need to rely on expensive out-of-home care for the loved ones, which at the end of the day, all of us as taxpayers are probably going to pay for. So we can do better than that in Minnesota. Uh, and one of the things we absolutely need to do is move forward on uh, this pro the legislation that will be introduced in the next week or two uh, to provide a program of paid family leave uh, for Minnesota families, for Minnesota workers, uh, in a way that actually is going to make sure that workers have that kind of flexibility that they need in the workplace. Um, the one other one I want to touch on is child care costs, and it's something that we didn't make the progress we, we would have liked to have made last year. Uh, Minnesota ranks among the most expensive states, as many of you know, uh, for child care. And you can see that the governor is taking some strides on this in his most recently passed budget, uh, but we need to do better uh, on, uh, on our CCAP program as well and actually fully fund uh, our child care supports and expand what we did. When I came in the legislature in 2002, uh, we had a huge budget deficit, and that was one of the places that we balanced the budget on, on working families with kids by cutting child care assistance. And we've never recovered that, and we need to do that uh, as soon as possible. You know, President Obama said uh, in his State of the Union, child, uh, high quality child care is not a nice to have, it's a must to have, and it's an economic imperative for a country, uh, and I think that we need to move forward on that. So, um, you know, the, the reality is all these policies that we worked on, the ones we passed last year, the ones that we're going to pass this year around earned sick leave, around uh, paid family leave, uh, they're not necessarily new ideas, they're not really radical concepts in a lot of the world. Uh, but here in Minnesota, I think we really can 
uh, make progress on these things and again set a model for the country in terms of what a, a state that really believes in their workers, a state that really believes uh, in their people, a state that really believes in families uh, can accomplish. And it's going to make a difference in the, those workers' lives and the lives of their families, but it's going to make a difference in all of our lives because it's going to make this state a better place. So let's make uh, paid sick time a reality. Uh, let's or earn sick leave. Let's make paid uh, family leave a reality. Uh, let's support workers and new moms and new dads and informal caregivers uh, uh, because they do so much for all of us and they will make our state a better place. Uh, we can do this. We know we have to set the example from last year that we can accomplish this. Uh, let's make 2015 uh, an even better year for economic security for families than 2014 was uh, because if we do that, we really are going to uh, transform the state uh, and make all of our lives a lot better. Thank you. Um. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, it's my distinct honor to introduce the governor of the state of Minnesota. If I can just make some advance, we'll see a picture of him. <laughs> picture of him signing the Women's Economic Security Act on Mother's Day last year. This is just the latest example of Governor Dayton's leadership on issues important to women and families. Thank you very much. I'm never, uh, never interrupt the Senate president when the Senate's in session, so I apologize for that. Uh, and. Uh, I got thank yesterday for the additional funding put into my budget for the uh, promised neighborhoods in St. Paul and Minneapolis, and I want you to know Representative Thiessen, still here? It's smart. Okay, he's there. He's smart. He's heard me speak before. He's on his way out of the door. He's the one who deserves the credit. He's the one who called me and, and persuaded me to increase the funding there. So uh, thank you, Representative Thiessen, for your leadership in that and so many other important areas. and. I, all I can say is, you know, that it, they may change the name, but until they install air conditioning, this will always be the Kelly Inn. Uh, so I admire your, your, your uh, perseverance already, but, you know, it's over 30 years ago that uh, I was working for Rudy Purpich, and he and his, uh, back then called Commissioner of Employee Relations, Nina the Rothschild, uh, I think Nina was going to coin the, the phrase, at least it was the first time I heard it, was, uh, equal pay for work of comparable worth, which seems pretty commonsensical and certainly seems like uh, it ought to be an, a requirement. And thanks to legislative leaders who are here today and thanks to so many of you who have worked so hard tirelessly during this time, uh, we've made great progress. But it's still, it's still a, a, a patchwork in Minnesota. And... You know, uh, James Madison once said that if men were angels, government would not be necessary. Well, I haven't seen men become any more angelic in my 38 years of government. So we have this inconsistency where some have adopted some very enlightened practices. I like, like to believe the state of Minnesota uh, has, has been part of that. But there's still just such a long, long ways to go. And that's why your commitment for being here today and our commitment to continue to work together. I, I, I really commend the, the legislative leaders who are here for the Women's Economic Security Act last year. That was a big milestone and a long step forward to where we ought to be. But uh, as I said, so much of it is still left at the discretion of uh, employers, some of whom are enlightened and some of whom have a ways to go. So, you know, you think of all the fight about the minimum wage, we took Somebody working full time in, uh, under state law could be paid less than half of the federal poverty level for a family of four, all the way up to somebody working full time being paid at the uh, level of federal poverty level, at two thirds of the federal poverty level. And uh, people thought that was a shocking, radical step forward. Two years when it reaches $9.50 an hour, it will be uh, two. Th uh, 80% of the federal poverty level for somebody working full time. So we say, why do, why do people work? Well, one of the reasons certainly is economic security. 
that you've identified. Well, there's no economic security in working 40 hours a week and not being able to raise your family's income to even the federal poverty level, much less beyond that. We just signed a contract with uh, SEIU for personal care attendance, and we, with their forbearance because of the political limitations in the legislature this time settled for a minimum wage or a floor of about $10.50 an hour and for all of five personal paid personal leave days for the whole year. Those are holidays, vacations, sick leave, family leave, five days a year. And a minimum wage of $10.50 an hour and, and five paid personal leave days is going to cost the state if it's approved by the you know, the workers and then approved by the legislature, about $8 million a year more than being paid now, which shows you the gap between what's minimally appropriate for people who are taking care of our fam friends, family, loved ones, and uh, not for not too long now for, for some of us uh, ourselves. I said, uh, you know, beware of the Personal care attendant, attendant whose career you save may soon become your own. And that's what we're doing with here, where people who are making a, who want to make a career out of taking care of other people and then aren't paying or responsibly for, for their efforts to do so. So we are looking at a long ways to go and we're looking at a need to continue to have the legislature and the executive branch of state government Set the, set the bar higher and higher so that uh, we won't be needing to uh, suffocate in the Kelly Inn in the years ahead because we'll be out there reaping the progress from all the hard work that all of you are engaged in. So I thank you very much for that and thank you for all your hard work to make uh, the progress we've achieved so far and, and, and now we're on to the next round. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Everyone who's still here, you're still with us. Thank you. It's it was so good to see this full room all day, and what? It said it was on. Okay. So thanks to everyone who is still here and, and those who've come and gone. And um, it has been so exciting to see this room packed all day. Um, it means so much to have us all here together and for everyone to take this much time out of their day. Um, and I've got to say, what an amazing day. Uh, I feel privileged to have learned um, uh, from our panelists all day. And I thank them so much for sharing their stories. Um, and their experience and their ideas, and the same with the audience. Um, I, I'm here, my name is Lisa Stratton. I'm a co-founder of one of the newer organizations in Minnesota that works on gender equality. We're called Gender Justice. We can always count on Betty to give us a plug. Betty was our board chair for our first three years. Um, thank you. Um, and we worked quite a bit on WESA last year, and um, we plan to keep going on what do we, we call it sometimes WESA 2.0, or, uh, uh, well, there are lots of different things. I'm starting to almost call it Daddy's WESA, because it seems like everybody's getting on board now. So. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to, uh, as I heard the panelists talk today, I kind of reflected a little bit on a few things that people said that seemed to resonate and seemed to be common among all of the panels. And, and one of those was this vi view of assets and deficits. And there was a lot of talk about sometimes women and particular communities being viewed as deficits um, when in fact they're assets. And the fact that we have the giant workforce participation rate that we do as women in this state, the highest in the nation, means we are assets. We are assets to this economy. We are ac assets to this government. We are access, uh, we are, are, I'm sorry, assets to our families. And we are doing all of those things. And I think we heard from each panel how hard that is hitting. And, how did we get there? Why is that? Well, we weren't working. We weren't, of course, at certain paid jobs outside the house. We were not welcome for many years. We are now out there in force in the economy. But the vision of what is an ideal worker, the way that our economy was set up and organized is still organized around the prior notions, an old outdated scheme that was designed to work well for people who have someone at home 
supporting them, taking care of home and needs of children and elders, the disabled, and uh, now we cannot continue to do both of those things without, uh, you know, as they say, burning that candle at both ends. Um, and it's so wonderful to have had legislators who are here and listening and helping and working with us to try to make our workplaces change to fit our current reality. And in doing so, I think it was wonderful to hear from uh, the business owner who said, you know, my employees are my asset, right? They're not a deficit. And we can do this. Um, we can both have workers who have the ability to do the things they need to do in their lives and a successful economy. They are not mutually exclusive. I wanted to say um, also that it was just a great feeling. I hope, I, I can't imagine I'm not speaking for everyone if I say, what great energy today and what smarts. Uh, just thrilled to see um, this expanding conversation and to hear new voices today and learn about not only what is the same about us, but what makes us different and our common, sort of common challenges and denominators. So I can tell you before last year, I had never done any work in the Minnesota legislature in my life. I happen to be a lawyer, but I've spent most of my time working, representing individuals um, or classes of people more in court. So I'm here to tell you, anyone out there, I know a lot of you do work regularly at the legislature, but anyone who doesn't, it's not that hard. <laughs> people want to hear from you. And believe me, those of you who are not regularly engaged at the Capitol, um, people who are working to advocate for bills, they run around saying, can we find some real people? Where's a real person? We need a real person to talk about this. So your stories are relevant. Your legislators want to hear your stories. Um, and they want you to come and say how public policy could be changed to help you and your family and your community. So I encourage everyone to do that. Um, just start, no matter how small an effort it is, a letter, a call, an email, it really makes a difference. Um, tell you just a little bit uh, before we can let everyone go about um, the status this year of legislative efforts that we started last year. Um, you all got your, uh, your packets today. Who has one? I just love this. We've got Women's Economic Security Act unfinished business. We did a lot of amazing things last year that I'm so proud of, and I'm so proud of everyone in this room who helped, but there's more to do. Uh, and we are we have worked up an agenda. We've thought really carefully and listened to everyone who brought things to the table with ideas for what should a women's economic security coalition work on at the legislature this year. We invite all of your input on that. Um, there are, I have some here if you want to come up to me or on the back table. There are one page flyers that detail um, not only our sort of primary agenda, which includes the fighting for earned sick leave and safe leave, um, which did not, we worked on in WESA last year, but did not make it, to give just one hour of every 30 hours worked of earned paid leave for when you and your family are sick. We have a really exciting new thing, Deb Fitzpatrick's been working really hard on it, of starting to have paid family leave insurance. You know, we're just one of the pariah countries that doesn't do anything for paying parents when they have children or their children have, are sick or have needs. So we're working on setting up a, a whole new system. And so that will need a lot of advocacy. We'll need you to be out there um, coming with us to testify and calling your legislator. So that's the second one. Um, and uh, we are working on helping more women get into non-traditional jobs. Um, like you heard from this panel, we want to see if, there are gonna, if it's going to be a transportation session. Let's make sure that the benefits, if we're going to do infrastructure spending, which would be terrific, but let's make sure that some of those jobs go to women. If you look at the uh, statistics on the flyer that the first panel prepared for us, look at the statistics of the number, the percentage of women working in jobs in construction and related industries. Um, it is abysmal. You are talking single digits, low single digits. So we're working on that. Um, 
if you want to support our agenda, there are a couple ways that you can do that. First of all, contact any of us um, who've popped up in front of you here today. Just come talk to us. We're open and, and ready. Um, also, pick up that flyer because it has on it our website, which is minwesa.org. M-N for Minnesota, WESA, W-E-S-A for the Women's Economic Security Act or Agenda, dot org. And when you get there, it will you'll look at a place, there's a tab called Take Action. So you can start there. We would love for you to have individuals and organizations can become part of the coalition. Um, you don't have to have a title behind you. You don't have to have a big organization, just you. We'd be happy to have you and, and keep you informed then about how these things go in front of the legislature. Um, so have I forgotten anything, Deb? <laughs> OK. Uh, well, thank you so much, everyone. And I want to say just one. I don't even know if she's in the room. But I said, well, we all decided, well, you, you only have five minutes, Lisa. You're not going to thank everyone, because that would be the entire five minutes. But there's one person who I think really deserves mention, which is Barbara Batiste, um, who has. <laughs> So, so thank you to Barbara and thank you to all of you um, for being here today and let's keep this conversation going. <laughs>